Welcome. Thank you everyone for being here today for the Passive House Component Spotlight with Zola Windows. We're really excited to have Sam McAfee join us today to talk about uh, solutions for landmark restorations. He's been a student of green building ever since buying his first Earthship books back in 1988. Since then, he's received an MFA in sculpture from UC Berkeley, designed web experiences for Gucci, HBO, and Showtime, and launched the green contracting company, Sumner Green, that executed one of the first Passive House retrofit projects in New York City back in 2010. So Sam has been engaged with retrofit work for, for quite a while. He went on to co-found 475 High Performance Building Supply, co-designed the Zola Windows uh, historic simulated double hung window, which we're, we're gonna be learning a lot about today. And he also started SG Build Consulting that worked alongside Bax Dingley architects to complete the first certified passive house in Manhattan in 2014 and the first landmark passive house in New York City in 2014. In 2016, he co-founded FenTrend, a global window and door marketplace and designed and developed a permit data analysis portal called FenIQ. He currently is with Zola Windows as a project manager specializing in passive house and New York City landmark renovation projects. He recently launched the New York City Low Carbon Building Social Networking Group focused on expanding the reach of high performance building knowledge into other segments of the New York City real estate market. So a uh, pretty varied and interesting background. We're really excited to have Sam here today. And with that, I'm just gonna hand it off to you, Sam. Thank, thanks, hello everyone. Thanks for the intro. I wanna confirm you can hear me, everything's good. Everything's good. All right, the handoff. Uh, yes, uh, as thanks for the intro in the background. I'm a big building nerd, <laughs> definitely a building nerd. Uh, and it's uh, beautiful to see the community growing and the interest out there for uh, producing higher performance, higher comfort buildings for everyone. Uh, as somebody who's been a part of like uh, the Passive House movement in New York since it was a meetup before even New York Passive House uh, existed, it's really exciting to see. Uh, the momentum towards a positive change for the city, as well as the historic projects that are, you know, so important to New York City. Um, I've been focused on high performance specifically because I have a passion for the craft of what was built in the past. You know, I, I got my chops as a design build person in the DC area for a little bit, and I found the construction quality to be so uh, insulting uh, with the way people <laughs> build now that I was like, I got to get back to New York City and, and get back involved with these beautiful old buildings and figure out how to uh, make it so they last the next 100 years. And so that's where my motivation comes from. And that's why I focus so much uh, on performance uh, intersecting with landmark projects, because really, uh, there's such beautiful structures and, and we, uh, the, the, the future is in actually our historic buildings. So uh, with that, I'm going to share my screen and start into my little presentation here. Uh, and I believe the structure is gonna be, I'm gonna do a short presentation. It's, 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 it's about 20 slides. I'm gonna uh, cover some stuff and then it's gonna be open to all of you to hit me with the, the hardest and toughest questions you can give me. I'm, I'm happy to go really deep and really nerdy and uh, give you what, what you need, so. Um, First picture here is, is, is a project on my very first passive house uh, that the clients moved into in 2010, uh, 2010, sorry. Uh, so it's been a long time, we're over 11 years. And, and the question I always have is one of these windows is a passive house and all the other three are not. And it's, it's, it's landmark at first was really pushing back and saying, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't do a simulated double hung. You can't do a fix over tilt turn. It, it has to be double hung. And we were like, actually, it doesn't look a lot different. We're getting really good. And in, and in this case, this is one of the older versions. And it's the one on the very far left is actually triple glazed R11 glass with uh, a, a fixed over tilt turn. And, and we've gotten even better at matching the uh, historic looks. Oops. Uh, and we've integrated into a lot of other projects uh, with different operations, especially in the hung windows and also in the French uh, type of historics. You know, historic is not all double hung. Uh, there's French, there's steel. Uh, steel's not there yet, but we're getting there. And I wanna thank Michael Ingui, who's here on the call for all of the projects and his commitment to the space, because honestly, as a background nerd who knows it, it really takes a, 
a committed architect and, and his commitment to having the conversation, very difficult conversation with the clients. Uh, but ultimately, uh, as, as you guys might know, Michael has committed full because uh, really using higher performance components in a building means draft free construction, means acoustic control of the environment, especially in an urban environment where uh, those are comfort, comfort criteria. As well as once a building gets tight, these historic buildings, you no longer have to like uh, integrate huge mechanical systems into the outer reaches of the building shell uh, because you don't have to overcome and put radiators in front of every window. Uh, so as a design element, it actually continues to allow these old buildings to uh, keep their uh, beautiful interior uh, infrastructure and not have to interrupt it with huge mechanical systems like has been the traditional approach. And that includes uh, integrating the historic, uh, uh, the historic stained glass that uh, comes with a lot of projects. In this case, this is actually using the existing windows that had stained glass and creating a double wall system. So on the outside is actually just a tilt turn, but the inside is the historic stained glass. And so we created a two window system just to keep the fabric of the LPC, just to keep that beautiful old detail while providing the exterior shell performance. So the key relationships that we look for are just like any window for a landmark. We want to know where your masonry opening is and what the glass line relationship to that is. Because we're going to design our window in the historic performance realm to match your lines and keep those glass percentages as tight as possible. There's a few weaknesses to it. We're, we'll, I'll go to it in the next couple slides. But overall, we get approved on hundreds of landmark projects in New York City because we hold the glass lines, keep the percentages, and, and match the shadow lines and the brick molds. That's what Landmark wants to see. The one differential, of course, is that we're not a hung window. We're not sliding. We're going to be a fixed over a tilt turn. The glass is heavy. Uh, and I like to say that they don't put sliding windows on a submarine for a reason. You don't get tight gaskets. And tightness is, is the key component to really making buildings perform. Air leakage is, is 60 plus percentage of the problem. It's really when cold air comes in, having to change it over. As cold air moves through the assembly and finds warm, moist air on the inside, it creates mold. As the temperature shifts, this is where most all of the problems happen, especially in old buildings that are tall and have leaky roofs and lots of air moving through them. Like shutting down that dynamic is the key to actually getting control over the comfort, the long term health of the building, as well as draft free and uh, uh, correct temperature and humidity control. So the weakness and the difference uh, in the windows, I'll just go to the negative here, is the crossbar uh, where the glass top, top meets the, the bottom piece. And, and, and a lot of older windows are very thin. And this is in fact an existing window here on the left. And they came with a one and a quarter. The truth is the glass is one, glass to glass is one and seven eighths. We're not too far off. We're not too far off, but we're also carrying way more weight and a lot more glass a much bigger assembly, like really, like you can't even fit our glass into that frame. In fact, in some cases, our glass is bigger than the existing frame. So the fact that we can still get these very tight glass to glass assembly for the exterior shadow lines while keeping the glass percentages while injecting massively more performance, triple gaskets, a lot more of everything, including the acoustic. So, a lot of people don't realize the, the range of glass that's out there and why the equations are what they are. Uh, we, the performance, optimal performance for a European, or for, sorry, for New York City for glass is, is the R1148 to 52 millimeter glass. That comes in at about eight and a half to 10 pounds per square foot. So if you're doing a double hung with glass that weighs that much, you're having to put in some very robust springs and weight systems, and that's a lot of weight to overcome. And it actually becomes a safety issue. So interestingly enough, the appropriate performance level for New York City means that a double hung window becomes unsafe. So there is a limit to the mechanics and the situation here, as well as the price. And, and interestingly enough, at Zola Windows, and the reason I've been involved with Zola Windows and I keep coming back to Zola Windows is because they're committed to the solution that performance doesn't necessarily cost more. 
And everybody always comes and says, oh my God, your windows are so much better. Uh, okay, how much are they? And I'm always like, if you're used to using a custom wood window in New York City, a dual glazed Marvin Ultimate or anything else, then you're already in the price class because we're about the same. And they're just, just shocked. And it's like the truth is over and over and over, performance doesn't cost more when you know who to talk to and when you find it. Windows are just too expensive in New York City too. That, that's part of the problem. So there's the opportunity, like good windows and custom windows cost a lot. But ultimately uh, good windows don't have to cost more. And with Zola windows, you get the benefits of all the other stuff like the large openings, which I'll allude to a little bit later. So we, we made the windows shine. We made them perform. We made them leak free. We made the acoustics amazing. This is one of the, this is a landmark project in, in Prospect Heights. Brooklyn, uh, and the thermals work against the uh, very low performing neighbor windows. This is a 12 degree night, this is cold. Uh, and you can see that this project decided not to do a performance door and not to use an airtight vestibule door. So the door was the weakness in a lot of projects. And the solution up until recently has been uh, put in a uh, dual glazed or triple glazed interior vestibule door. and and, and and that's actually the traditional solution for all old homes. The oldest homes in New York City don't have a vestibule. And then they had to start putting in a second vestibule door just to solve the leaky front door, air drafts coming in in winter. Like it's the most uncomfortable spot in an old building if it's not solved properly. So we took it upon ourselves to actually solve the problem. And we did. Here is uh, the three pieces of a proposal to us. The left is the actually uh, uh, the door they want to match for a historic landmark. The, the middle is the dimensions and design that they've requested. Again, thank you, Michael Ingui and his team, because this is one of their projects as well. And uh, we like to think that at Zola, we, we, we bend over backwards to provide and, and, and lead with solutions and work with our customers in order to like uh, really, really make it so they can get what they want design-wise. And so what we have on the right, is in fact our shop drawing with a triple glazed, high performance, triple gasketed, airtight, passive house level door that exactly matches the historic requirements of this door to look exactly like the proposed. So it's unremarkable in the drawings because there's really not a lot of difference going on, but that's amazing because the door difference here is that you no longer need to do vestibule doors to get high performance in townhouses. You can actually drop the vestibule now because we're providing all the performance you need in a landmark matching door at the facade level. So you're getting real estate back as well as a budget cut. So this is actually a big deal. And, and I know this because I used to be a landmark contractor and I used to have to do these curves and details and brownstoning and everything. And, and, and and so we've been focused on this solution just so we can actually expand the passive house uh, facade. Uh, so here's some sections and details so you can see that actually we've integrated a uh, solid panel and now we can cut any dimension you need. If you want eight inch rails or seven and five eighths or seven and one thirty seconds or whatever you want. If you want a four inch rail, we can do this. We can actually apply it. We can do curved glass, we can do arc glass, we can do different to a point. And the, and the point is when it comes to the complexity. Here's an 1842 hand carved molding on a door that I'm replicating right now on Cranberry Street in Brooklyn Heights, New York. I mean, we're talking about a 179 year old door with, with an artisan carved detail. Now, anybody who's gonna replicate this has a situation with this door. This is crazy complicated. So what we're doing actually is we're going to be providing the infrastructure. We're going to be providing the recessed panel without the molding. We're going to be providing possibly the uh, 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 trim details. But what we're doing is we're working with the site contractor so they can actually finish off on site with the local artisans who specialize in this molding, uh, the door that we provide. So we're providing all the high performance, the componentry and the hardware, and then they're going to go in and stick trim it uh, to finish it off so it matches the rest of the detail. And so this, this house is so old that it doesn't have a vestibule. And it was a very big situation because they're installing triple glaze throughout. And this front area was going to be so weak that any leakage in the rest of the house was going to appear around this door and move into the hallway and up into the house. This is going to be un, un, completely uncomfortable during winter. 
but in fact, now it has the possibility of being one of the more comfortable places in the house. So I, I'm really proud of this. I mean, of course, I'm proud of the double hung and the, and the commitment from, from Zola over the last uh, decade plus to like work on this. But more importantly, like the door solutions and the whole package now means that there's no cutting corners. Like we can actually go and uh, make these houses like literally 150 years from now, people are gonna be like, these houses are still around. This is beautiful. I can't believe these 300 year old houses are performing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to not being here, but anyway. <laughs> Maybe I'm healthy enough to make it halfway. Um, so what about the rest of the house? Well, the beauty is that we do big glass. And in Europe, they do very big glass. We're really constrained by our containers and what we can ship. Uh, as a student of glass, uh, the largest triple glazed unit I've ever seen was uh, 18 and a half foot tall by 56 and a half foot wide. And it was a production at a trade show to say, from the glass company, Press Glass. They said, we can make it this big. Why aren't you making units that can take it? And so that was about six years ago. And, and now we can do very large glass. And what that large glass allows us to do is on the penthouses in the back of the house, uh, connect it up. And again, Michael Ingui, congratulations on the beautiful projects that you've <laughs> well, we've worked together on. And, and so you can connect the inside to outside while having massive performance. I mean, this is an R11 facade here that's all glass. Uh, same goes for the rest of the penthouse uh, and it goes for operation. We have, you know, fixed, we have these tilt turn systems. I'm, I'm sorry, we have lift slide systems here that are, are four, four, four corner gasketed. Uh, for some of you who don't understand maybe what a lift slide is versus a slider, uh, a lift slide system is, you can see the big crank arm on there. A lift slide is when you crank that down, it actually lifts the window off of its gasket system at the head and the and the bottom, as well as it releases it from the multi-point gasket connections on the uh, middle and side, and allows this huge, heavy, beautiful door to slide effortlessly to the side, open it up, and then when it goes back and engages and it cranks down, it uses the weight of the window to re-engage it to all four uh, corner, all four sides of its gasket. So you get passive house tightness. Category four, very airtight while having large operable doors, no longer are sliding units the weakness in the house. And, and then you also have breeze panel uh, operation or nano wall, which like, if you want to use a brand name that lots of people uh, like to throw at it, which allow for you to have full door opening. So you can have full inside to outside connections. Again, another beautiful, <laughs> another beautiful landmark project, Michael. Um, and then back walls as well. Once you want to like open up kitchens, put in transoms, get lots of glass, connect the inside to outside, as well as doing large uh, glass wall. Both of these are landmarked and then also pocket door on the right. Uh, so you can actually hide the doors and get that full inside to outside connection. But, I, but, but, but all these projects are, are, are limited in their width and limited in their design. And what we actually can do is massive. And in some cases, even bigger than this. Like we work from eight by ten pieces, eight, foot, eight by ten foot pieces of glass. We do hidden frames with seam and embedded. Uh, the corner here is a frameless corner. That's just a glass to glass connection. So there is no wood frame. There is no uh, metal frame. It's just literally a, a glazed corner, which really can draw the connection in and out between the two the, 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 the nature or the, the backyard or the penthouse connection and the patio. And so what that does is. Zola has the ability to literally integrate inside to outside while still providing extremely high performance connections, extremely acoustically sensitive. Uh, our uh, base stoppage is 27 to 28 OITC. And our, our, we can spec it even higher. We can get it up into the 40, 40s on the OITC. And for those who, of you who understand acoustics, that's very high. And we can do that easily because our, our windows are airtight and we have the glass to do it. So that was a quick, that was much quicker. I could keep going, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause there because that was like a, a hit. <laughs> and then I'm gonna uh, uh, open it up for, for people to ask questions about projects and, and, and pick it apart. And, I, and feel free to ask me mean questions too. I, I, why would you do this? LPC, why would you ruin a building? I, I mean, we've heard it all. And, and, and I don't think there's a wrong way, but I, I think the, the question just needs to be asked, so I'm open to it. 
Great, awesome. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I, we have a couple of questions in the queue. Uh, and as you have questions of, of Sam, please uh, put them in chat, and I will I'll, I'll track them and we'll and we'll address them in, in order. So um, first up, we have Richard Pansiera, and then we have Ken uh, Newhauser after that. So Richard, are you are you there and available to ask your question? Uh, yes, I am. Great. I'm uh, sorry. I, I just had, I actually have a couple of questions, but you know, I was going to type another one in. But anyway, the first question I asked is we, we have a, I'm a, I'm a sort of involved with a local historic preservation commission. And um, we're looking at a project right now where they want to use triple glazed windows. They want to do a, like a deep energy retrofit. Um, and um, I suggested using Zola because I knew that they had to sort of stim simulate a double hung and the house is full of double hung windows. But one of the things that was question by the owner and the architect was how small a unit can you guys make because we have some small double hung windows and the next question i have to ask is do you get questions about um people talking about well the reflections of of uh, triple glazed windows in historic buildings that the windows look different you know because the reflections are different versus single glazed um is or like single glaze with a storm outer storm do you get questions like that and then how do you deal with those questions so so that also has to do with birds so <laughs> I'll, I'll start with the reflection uh, question first and i have an image here and you can actually see on the left hand side that that's a triple glaze uh, slightly fritted glass and it does have a fractured reflection it's not like a mirror right you can actually see that there's like as you get closer to it there's like three trees three suns it's like three windows that it's reflecting off of right well Interestingly enough, uh, it doesn't really register to most people as they walk by it, but more importantly, the birds can see it. And so the birds don't think that it's a reflection of the nature and tend not to fly into it as much. So it's kind of a balance between glass uh, being good for humans and good for the, the nature. Uh, ultimately, once the windows go in, nobody ever talks about it. They might talk about it up front uh, if they're looking for uh, interest, uh, the second part is, and this is a question you didn't ask about glass. As I walk, and my daughter, she's 16, she hates that I pointed this out to her. As I walk around New York City, I look at like how flat glass is, like big facades of buildings, and I'm like, okay, they used about the cheapest glass they could. Look at how, like, the reflection looks like it's like the surface of a water, like the you know the buildings around. And then you come across a, a European product uh, on a large building, and I'm like, look how flat and beautiful that reflection is. And so the more glass there is, I mean, the glass we use is so flat and so high quality. And, and so, yes, you have multiple pieces of glass giving multiple reflections, but you also have super, super flat glass and the reflections you do see are like very, very smooth. You don't get these like very hyper wavy kind of facades. Uh, the first question about size, mm -hmm. I have to ask how small is small? Oh, there is a yeah. limit, it's in like the 22 to 24 inch on the width uh yeah it's at least yeah 18, it, it probably no, more, maybe 16. 18 maybe i don't know um and then you know probably 18 by 36 or somewhere there around that range that's I, a tiny weight we might recommend doing a full tilt turn with a crossbar and okay. then any divisions because uh, really when it comes to those frames the frames are robust and at a certain point uh but, but we do often get window requests that are that small uh Sometimes they come with a lot line fire rating request too. Hopefully that's uh, not the case here. No, not in this particular okay. case. It's a single okay. family residence and it's in okay. a, you know, sort of a nice little domestic neighborhood and um, it's a masonry building. And it's, you know, it's not a particularly, you know, startlingly beautifully detailed building, but it's, but it's a, you know, it's in a local yeah. historic district. And, you yeah. know, as a member of the preservation commission, we're always having to grapple with um, people wanting to replace their windows. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we have a, you know, like all historic preservation, you know, commissions, we have a you know, very staunch sense of, set of guidelines and, and we usually try to take each project as they come along. But so uh, the and, project you know, behind me that's behind uh, me is, is in Manhattan and it's not only landmark, but it's actually historic registered. So we, we have been through this and we've interacted much. So. I'm sure you have. And, you know, there's a lot of commissioners who, you know, who just want to just stick by the, you know, we really don't understand. I mean, I think, so, you know, we, yes, on one hand, we're trying to preserve historic character of the buildings, but I, I argue there's always a way to do that. Um, 
but you know there are commissioners that say well you know why do we have to do this why can't you prove to me that you can do a for instance a, a you know like a deep energy retrofit and and use you know restore the original bubble hung windows and put a storm window on the outside can show me how that if that's feasible you you, know? you you can do a double you could do a double window to the inside as well you could keep the existing window and stick a second dual glazed airtight tilt turn on the interior we've seen that throughout europe uh Definitely airtightness is the thing you need to hear. And I, and I, I, I think it's really interesting and I, and I might get a lot of tough questions and, and kind of like some arrows thrown at me for saying this, but mm -hmm. while the historic, the historic preservation wants to keep the exterior of the facade looking exactly like the original, the, the interior of the building works nothing like <coughs> the original. Sorry, my dog's in the background there. The interior of the building looks nothing like the original. That's it, right. it, there's so much more humidity being produced. There's kitchens. They're no longer using dried out fireplaces to heat the place. There's steam, there's showers, there's hot water being produced, there's people. And, and ultimately airflow through a building, all of that moisture makes it up into the roof and through the ceiling and condenses on the masonry. I mean, if you take a bu old building apart, you look up there, you're like, why is the roof failing? Did it leak? No, it's actually where the cold air meets all the moisture from all this interior living and like starts to degrade the joist and sag the roof and destroy the building. So, so we're really talking, I mean, me personally, I'm talking about tightening up the shell to match the retrofit of the, the use on the inside. So while keeping the look and it's, it's about the preservation and the long-term health of the buildings that I really am looking at, so. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Yeah, sure. All right, fantastic. So Ken, you're up next. Thank you. And Sam, thank you for showing us a unicorn. Um, you know, all the, uh, all the architects that we work with tell us this doesn't exist, um, that there is no high performance window that can get by uh, Landmarks Commission. So I think you may have answered my question already with the, the building behind you. I was going to ask if you have National Park Service approval of any of your windows. Uh, I don't know that we have National Park, but we have Historic Registry. Are they interconnected? So typically, if there are federal tax credits involved, then it's the National Park Service is the authority having jurisdiction. I think that's what this building was. Yeah. And I can find out. This is a, yeah, this is White Street and Broadway. It's a Historic Registry building. So Okay, great. They actually were so easy. It was LPC that was the problem. The Historic Registry approved it very quickly. Uh, these windows were five foot two by ten six on the on the second floor. So these are very large, triple glazed. Great. Well, I think that hits my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Ken. So uh, we have a couple of questions from Kazuko Ono. So one is about uh, delivery time, and the other is I think she'd like you to um, share. Um, the support that Zola provides in terms of ordering and, and design work. Um, so. so so delivery times is a horrible question in this time of COVID. Every time a, a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal, you know. Anyway, um, ultimately, uh, the traditional uh, delivery time for contract to site is uh, 12 to 14 weeks. That's, that's where we have been for years. And then COVID hit, and we added two weeks, then we added four weeks. I think it's coming back down a little bit. Uh, I think in the fall to, to, to uh, end of year, it's going to go back to normal. That's where it seems to be coming back. The prices, everything seems to be like normalizing. Uh, it's the same conversation we're having about the shortages in electronic chips for car manufacturing. It's all tied to that same thing. So uh, we typically say 12 to 14 weeks for wood windows. And uh, right now it's, it's a three or four weeks more than that. But uh, by the time projects that come in now, I don't think it's going to be like that. It'll be back to 12 to 14 weeks. Uh, the other question was? Uh, help in ordering and, and design design support. So so I we have shop drawings. We definitely do all that. And I will work through uh, the uh, uh, relationship details between the historic uh, masonry openings. I do shutter calculations, interior shutter calculations, shade pockets, help through all that kind of stuff. And I'll do some sketches and provide that uh, support for both uh, LPC submission. We don't do the LPC submission on behalf of the architect, <clears throat> but we do provide tons. And I, I even do get glass calculation relationships so they know the square footages and stuff like that. I do spreadsheets like that. So pretty much everything you need, like 
to ease the pain because it is complicated, but I've gone through it so many times that it's like really quick for me. So I'm here to help everything. So. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. All right. So next up is Sai. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Sam. Hey, we've um, been using Zola for all of our solutions. I think it's about I don't know, six years ago, so seven years ago. Awesome. And um, I was wondering if if this project we did in Louisville, Kentucky, um, for a home or a home we did, a model home, was that the first one we did to simulate double hung on because we were working with you all and we missed a couple things that um, I'd like to share too. So I don't think you worked with me on it, but yeah, you, you worked with Zola. Maybe it was before I came back. I've been back about two and a half years. So. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and so we had uh, done one of the bedrooms, I guess. Um, it wasn't large enough for egress. So uh, at least the top sash is fixed, the bottom was, was a tilt turn operable. Mm -hmm. So we missed that accidentally. Um, although if we had both the top and the bottom together, we'd have been fine. You know, if they both worked the same. We, we, could, have, we could have done that as one tall tilt turn with a crossbar, but it wouldn't have been in an offset configuration. It would have just been one operable window that kind of started to look like these. So. Yeah, see, so that's that's what we were wondering if you are able to do that offset because this neighborhood we did this home or home and was one of those new urbanism type neighborhoods and it's got very strict architecture rules behind it. Yeah. So they did have to have that, you know, offset top sash from the bottom sash. We can't do uh, that as a, a, we can't do an offset in one large sash. And interestingly enough, I don't think the double hung would have had the egress either. If that's the case, because our opening would be bigger than the double homes opening. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, since it was new construction, we kind of designed oh, you know, different it. shapes and sizes. It was Got Italianate, it. although it, you know, yeah, okay. but it'd be, we would love to see if you're able to do that because with that solution, we could probably uh, make it a lot easier for people to clean as well. We can certainly look into it if you want to throw us a sketch and tell us exactly what you're looking for or something like that. I'll be very straightforward and honest about like what we could possibly do. Uh, and uh, the, the one thing that I could think of is that we actually do, and I'm just talking out loud, of course, the factory is, is the ultimate. <laughs> but you know, if, if you're not needing triple, we can put dual and dual offset. So it's dual and dual, you know what I mean? pushed one way, pushed another way, but I don't know. Let's, I would like to, I'd be curious to get a more a detailed picture of what you're talking about. Okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, we appreciate your all's flexibility because we came up with some custom designs on the front door and you all were able to make it work out. And it's pretty awesome to see you able to do that. We, it's, it's what we like to do. I mean, it's my pleasure point, which is a pain point as well, but anyway. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Sai. All right, next up is Michael Davidoff. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, just a question about blinds inside the pane. Is that something that's even available? Uh, it's something that we're talking about. Interestingly enough, just uh, yesterday I was having that conversation. Uh, it is very European. Uh, what that is, is that's really two windows put together. Uh, for us, we're gonna need to keep the blinds out of the performance glass and we would then put an additional the blinds on the exterior and then another window outside of that. That's a very European product that's not in the United States by anybody that I'm aware of. So uh, for, and, and, and just to paint a bigger picture of what this philosophically is, uh, in the performance realm, you really do have to put the blinds on the outside. You have to stop the energy from getting through the window in the first place. And blinds on the inside of a window, if it's, if it's, it's only for light, if you think about it as like making the window perform better, the energy's in, it's heating the blind, it's in the room your conditioning system has to handle it. That's just the philosophy. That's the way the energy works. It's not being reflected back out the window. So in Europe, they, for hot or uh, preventing, uh, uh, preventing heat uh, buildup, the, the blinds go on the exterior. And that could be either in the glass or literally on the outside of the window. So we do have solutions for blinds on the exterior of the window. They're not landmarked. <laughs> Landmark projects that have uh, solutions like that, they're, they're exterior shutters with pencils, you know. <laughs> some buildings have that, colonial, some don't. Um, uh, we, we don't currently do exterior shade in the glass, uh, but we, uh, I mean, we're gonna get there eventually, but it, there's very few people who ask for it. It's just not something that seems to trend with design in the United States right now. So there's very little demand for it, unfortunately. 
Does that answer your question? It's unfortunate that that's the case, Thank but you, so yes. few people ask for it. So that's the problem. Great. Thanks, Michael. Okay, uh, next up Zach, is Rob. I to, yeah. I, Zach, I wanted to add that that's across all manufacturers. That's not just a Zola answer. That's across yeah. like hundreds of manufacturers. I, 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 I tour, I, I, known, I did the fin trend, I know all the windows. So I just wanted to answer that as a general question. Yeah, yeah, good clarification. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, okay, up next is Rob Harrison. Hey, Sam. Uh, hey, thanks Rob. for the great uh, presentation. I, um, I have a project in Seattle. Uh, it's uh, not uh, historic, but um, it has that look. And uh, many of the uh, windows are actually pretty narrow, um, like less than two feet RO. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, the, the issue that I've run into in the past with Passfoss windows is that the frame size, if we, we put, if we put a normal Zola window in uh, an opening that that's that small, uh, there's not going to be much glass left and uh, clients are not um, happy with that. So is there any, um, is there like a thin line Zola um, version or, you know, what can we do in that case? Uh, it's a, you know, these are strictly replacement windows too. That's the other challenge. It's, um, we're not actually uh, changing the uh, exterior envelope. Okay. And so, and so does your replacement wall, did it, are these windows with weight pockets or without weight pockets? Uh, they are with weight pockets. So, so our window can go into that weight pocket like up to three inches. Oh, okay. Yeah, that in a lot of windows, we actually wrap a half or three quarter. I mean, we go and match the glass to masonry, but that doesn't mean you have to keep that. You can, our window can sit behind your masonry up to three inches. This is actually wood frame with, with siding. Um, okay. But, um, which gives you that narrower, of course, on the inside, we're still gonna have the same operational width, but on the outside, you're gonna really uh, uh, shut it down. You're gonna probably half the frame exposed. Interesting. Um, I'll send you the window schedule. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Rob. Okay, Paul Thompson. Uh, hey, Sam. Um, you know, we're, we're here in Philip. <laughs> How you been? <laughs> uh, good, good. Um, uh, I, I have a, my, my question is a little bit of a, a rant about historical, historic doors. We have, um, you know, as you know, we're, we're in a, um, a four, four unit, four story historical row home here in Philadelphia. We, we got permission from the historic commission to put in um, uh, passive house windows and doors. Um, and we're, every time we, we you know, we've got uh, a, a couple of the opaque um, you know, big heavy wood doors with the multi-point latching system, and it seems like I don't know if it's a, if it's an installation of problem or if it's a if it just a, just comes with the doors, but they're kind of a pain in the rear, you know. Um, right, you got to pull the handle up, you got to do the thing. Keying has been a real issue for us, you know, trying to get that one key, um, like a master key situation. I think we've spoken to you about this before, complained about it. Uh, in general, um, is our U European manufacturers trying to address those sort of issues, like Americanizing the uh, the products? So, so when it comes to keying, we were able to uh, train uh, locksmiths in New York City. I think in Philadelphia, you're still not quite there. It's not the same type of barrel. And what I did is I actually went around donating old barrels to local locksmiths just so that they could practice keying these and now they're fine with it. So they're they're very accustomed to seeing the European barrels uh, in, in New York City. Uh, and by the way, Zola's gotten really good at shipping new barrels as well. So uh, we have uh, been hiring over the last 12 months and, and we're, uh, the whole system's much better. So if there's something that you're currently dealing with, just put in the request right now again, you'll see probably it come right through and we'll fix the problem. That might be just shipping you all new barrel sets, which might be the easiest, so. Yeah. Uh, what was the, the handle with the weight uh, uh, no, just, just that you know, locking the doors right with the multi-point right. To get, we we have there, these are clear wall doors, which which I think are great, but I, and I suspect it's probably um, cuts across all doors with the multi-point locking system. In no, order to, no, it's actually clear wall has its own issue with that, so definitely don't throw Zola in with it. Uh, and I'm not trying to just badmouth somebody, but yeah. but uh, yes, we've been used as the doors on other projects, and I'm, it's not the first time we've heard this. Okay. Our, ours tend to not have that problem, but it is a, for the multi-point, 
to get the high performance, it is a crank. It's not just a single like, you know, quarter turn, half turn. It is literally two turns because it's a cam that comes out that slowly wedges the door into its tight position. That also has to do with adjustment, the type of hinges, how it's adjusted and how tight you want that gasket to be. The tighter you want it, that little, that little like cam at the end can be actually quite a bit. If you don't want it so tight, you can actually back off that. So a lot of it has to do with adjustment and also the quality of the hinge holding it up. Cause I think, I think the door you're talking about keeps falling, right? And you keep having to like cam it back up and then it falls. It has, out. yes. I know it's not us. We don't have that problem. We, we use a different hinge. All right. Uh, by the way, I, I love the lift and slides are awesome. I, I would design out the swinging doors and only use lift and slides if I could. They move like butter. They're so smooth. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Paul. Okay, up next is Robert Tanner. Yeah, Sam, great uh, presentation. And uh, I'd like to hear more about Zola's simulated steel and uh, Muntins and how you accomplish the uh, uh, U ratings, SHGC, and noise ratings with the simulated uh, steel. So uh, we're not to steel yet, so I, I can't go and say too much about it. And uh, we do have a steel supplier. I was happy to find out that it's probably happening in the fall, probably happening in the next few months, which is beautiful. And, and that means steel performance lines. And there's a lot of projects I want to go after and, and talk about with that. Uh, and, and more importantly, uh, steel prices for windows in New York City are outrageous. And a lot of times not even with the glass, which is just crazy. That's not the case here. This is like a, a huge performance kicks in two plus to three times and also price going down. Um, so I don't have all the answers to what you're asking. I, well, I, I know the product lines that we're going to go and use. Uh, it is about like aluminum and thinner. Depends on the performance you want to hit. Still multi points. So it's steel that can accept a multi point hardware system. Uh, Go ahead. And if you wanted to to simulate steel with either a wood clad or fiberglass or UPVC, do you have a solution for not paying a steel uh, steel uh, price with an alternative that looks like steel? We have an aluminum system that is super it's like one of the thinnest aluminum systems and it has got the same steel offsets and we can do the exterior steel colors yeah yeah and and you just hit it there you're trying to do steel and at a certain point steel is the lowest performing while being the most expensive frame and at a certain point you're like okay now that i've thrown so much performance into the steel frame the steel frame is the same size as an aluminum frame so why am i going for steel when i can just switch over to the aluminum so it is that back and forth between budget uh when it comes to actually the requirement for steel replacement on a historic building in, in this context, uh, we'll come up with a solution for that by end of year. Uh, I've already been going after it. We know the product lines and we've got a manufacturer uh, support uh, team that's gonna uh, do it for us. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Robert. Okay, Sean Denniston is next. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the double wall approaches that you had mentioned earlier. You know, I think in historic preservation, there's a lot of talk of using storm windows, and that's essentially a double wall approach. Um, you know, sometimes that historic window does need to stay because it's not just about form. Sometimes it's about the fabric or the function. You know, that 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 door that you are talking about. You know, you're you're losing more than just an image by replacing it. So. Can, can you talk some more about the, the double wall approaches that you have that could be utilized? Um, any window manufacturer, and I'm going to speak, I'm, not, I'm going to unsell Zola a little bit. Okay. You can stick an Anderson crank casement on the inside of any double hung and drastically increase the performance of your assembly. Because it's pretty much adding the performance of the new window to the existing performance of whatever's on the outside, creating a cavity. But, but what you're getting is you're getting two operations where you have to open the inside window to open the outside window. And that's a very traditional, I don't have a good window approach. I don't have a single window that can do it for me. You can even put a shade in that cavity. You know, I mean, I suggested this for a steel window replacement on Park Avenue recently where they really need the steel lines. And I said, you should retrofit the existing steel. You should find some good glass to put in there and you should just 
go to Skyline, who's supposed to be the installer for this project, and ask Skyline for a, a decent t tilt turn dual glazed or something. And the, the combination of those would dramatically change the performance of that install because it's the two windows together. It has been the approach for the last 60 years when it comes to these types of projects. Um, it could be any window, any good window. But again, that window has its quality, has its adjustment, has how big is its frame, how tight really is it, how many points of connection does it have to compress those gaskets. Like it, it all comes down to that same question. And then a lot of people just don't want two windows. They actually don't want to engage through two pieces of glass. They don't want to open and clean two sets of windows and have dust or whatever. I don't, there's so much going on with that. What was the, you had a shade? What was the other part of your question? No, that that was the, okay. the core of it. Yeah, because sometimes you replace the window and you replace the window. You do the best you can. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the window has to stay. And so you know, the good options for that, especially when you're dealing with um, how much depth do you have to put in a second window. So so I'm sorry, the second part was the beautiful door. And I it does break my heart. And I, I agree with you. Like the door, if it, the door should stay. But at this point, there is no one who's willing to take that door and remill the existing door into a high performance connected assembled. Like that's gonna be the future, but right now there's no, that we don't have an artisan locally who can do that. It has to be rebuilt from scratch. Honestly, if I were to go and restart my career, maybe I would open a mill shop and do just that, but, <laughs> but not gonna happen probably. Yeah. And I, I did just wanna mention that the, you know, so I'm, I do sustainability, but I'm also a trained preservationist. So I kind of, yeah. I do both of them. Um, the, the New York City Landmarks Commission is a little bit idiosyncratic. So, you know, I, I think people who might be in other parts of the country who are listening uh, should be, sh should think about that, that the approval process might look different for them. And they really need to look at their local approval process to see what it's going to look like for them. Because New York is weird in that it's, it's really strict about some things and then really loose about other things. And you'll find uh, different jurisdictions will have a different balance of what you can do within their regulations and within their culture. And, and you're right, Sean. And, and, and it actually is uh, slightly political as well. So it, it changes with each group that comes in to head it up. And, and we're fine with it. We've worked through all of it. We've gone backwards and forwards. It's, it's part of the fabric of New York. We love it. So. Great. Good points, Sean. Thank you for the question. Okay, up next is Michael Cornegay. Hey Sam, great great presentation. Boy, you Thanks, really Michael. are a window nerd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just a couple of questions. One more application. You mentioned you had uh, done a fixed over a tilt turn, and my question is that at that point where you jo where they joined that, how are you able to match the re the VG requirements, even though that's going to be somewhat thicker than the the check rail you're replacing? You see, you see this cross-section comparison I pulled up here. You can okay. take a look. So we're actually tucking a, an operable window up behind the sash of the fix just to get that glass-to-glass -glass relationship. There is a larger shadow line at night, okay. but the historic fabric during the day and the look holds. Uh, we'll be continuing to refine windows to get thinner and thinner and thinner, but we do need space to both put structure, multi-point gaskets, and lots of glass like so but this is the detail i mean contact us i'll give you cad files you can kind of start to compare we'll do sketches and this and that a lot of the old windows are super thin they're like just a piece of timber with a piece of glass and uh, the higher the quality of wood uh, you know actually this is the really unfortunate is that the uh, older trees are no longer available to create really stable thin profiles that's that's like the key to what the problem is here the, the trees and the lumber available to actually make windows right now is, is young trees and they twist and turn and you need thicker pieces of those type of trees for stability. And, and we don't have that old growth material like they originally did, so. And, and part two question on uh, installation. Is mo are most of your installation brick to brick or, or some sort of modified rip? Cause you like you have a very thick profile. Uh, it ends up that our profile is actually dead on to a lot of the existing windows because, mm -hmm. and that's that's not necessarily with uh, the shade pocket at all. Like in this case, we're actually proud of the masonry opening by, by a fraction. Uh, sometimes we're maybe like a, a quarter to a half an inch behind the masonry opening. 
Uh, but we start with brick to brick, and then I ask what the glass to brick relationship is, and then I'll give you a detail with your brick mold to show you your shadow lines with our units, and you'll find that it's actually historically pretty pretty dead on. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michael. So the next question is from Kazuko Ono, and she asked asked me to ask it. And I anticipate that the answer might be fairly short. So the question is, are there Zola skylight windows? Uh, so uh, skylight and window are not the same thing. <laughs> and Zola does, not, point. Zola does not do skylights currently. Uh, we, I should ask, we did do like a 31 degree pitch postless window that actually was on the roof and on the wall, but that was many years ago. I'm not sure we're still in doing those. Uh, we don't do skylights, but there are some really good curved skylights out there as a 475 and a passive house and, a, you know, the Lama Lux and the Facros that are available through a lot of the other people in the network. They're really beautiful units, really beautiful units. Uh, secondly, mm, I want to officially say this. Uh, hopefully my bosses aren't listening. <laughs> there was a project where they're like, look, just give us a structured piece of glass. Here's the spec. And I'm like, okay, there's the glass in a UPVC frame. And they just took the glass and did what they wanted with it. I'll just throw that out there. I'm like, but that's not us. We don't, we don't do skylights officially. So, but we do sell you a glass in a UPVC frame is that, if that's what you want to buy from us. It's really cheap that way. <laughs> On the download. Okay. Not Next warranted. Question. There's no warranty. <laughs> right, right, right. right. I, don't, I, don't us, so. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so next up is uh, Prescott Perez Fox. Yeah. Hello. Um, so first of all, thank you for sharing. Um, my grandfather was a pioneer in, in glass recycling and in, in the patent of tempered glass back in the fifties. So yeah. he would love, he would love this sort of in our DNA. We'll talk um, low iron and white glass and color. It'll be fun. Yeah. It'll be, be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick follow-up about the locks for the doors. So it was a little shocking that with all this high technology, high performance, you're still using keys like a like a gremlin, like a caveman. I mean, is nobody doing uh, combination locks, touch ID, like fingerprints, uh, smart locks, anything like, like the, the people that make the doors that are not thinking that ahead into the those next are, step? Those are all retrofit, yes. And they're iPhone connected, that's all out there, yeah. Oh, okay. We, and if you if you want to come have a conversation, we can find that. But it's it's like a post thing. That's like a yeah, we sold you the door, and now it's going to be mounted to the inside, separate. So. Okay, that was just a quick question. I was like, everyone's so obsessed with keys, but I right. actually last thing for anyone, I recommend changing your lock for a, a push button combination. It's so freeing not to walk around with keys. And if only, you my, know, if only my car didn't need a fob, that would be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> But, but but yes, it's retrofit. We have we had some. We don't have an official one right now. Uh, we have very long barrels, so uh, most of the manufacturers don't make them for that. But in Europe, it's exploding. China supplying it. There's a lot more options, so we can we can probably solve that for you. Uh, oh, sorry. Second part is that we often do commercial or semi-commercial multifamily entries, and we do electronic buzzer type of uh, releases and stuff like that. So even though the tongue is coming in, we have like release channels. So we do a lot of that kind of integration. We don't give you the computer system. Your, your guy has to wire it, so. Fantastic, thanks Prescott. So we have gotten through the questions. This has been an amazing hour, Sam. Is there anything else you wanna add before, before I, uh before I close it up here? Uh, well, as a, as a longtime student and, and somebody who used to buy windows, like my first, uh, the reason I became a window guy is because uh, my first landmark project, I was a GC. I owned a construction company and I'm like, sure, I'll do passive house naively. I got a PhD in passive house by spending money, losing money and doing the air seal a couple of times. Uh, well, the two things I learned about that were A, when the windows came, uh, sorry, three things. A, when the windows arrived, I was shocked. I realized I had never seen a window before because all of the Marvins, all the Andersons, all of these like little three quarter inch, like you got to shim it to make it fit kind of things. I was like, I was unpacking furniture, furniture grade, like high, like the, the windows were stronger than the wall I was sticking them into. And it just shocked me. And at that point, that's when I became a window person. I was like, oh my God, but it's not the same word. How do I use a different word to describe what just showed up with glass in it? And so ever since then, I've been in love with like 
the, the, the game of like bringing quality into the market, just like I hated the construction and the design build field I was in. Uh, the quality is like missing and bringing quality in, it's crazy to do this, especially when it's not necessarily a budget conversation. Like shockingly to me, windows are overpriced in America for what they are compared to what the global window market can supply. And so that's the beautiful thing about why I do what I do is like, I'm like, yeah, this is this. And by the way, it ends up costing less. Like this door you're looking at here, if you were to get this custom door made in New York City with the side lights and skin, I'm like, you'd be spending over 10,000 easily. We're, we're cheaper than the alternate, which is crazy. So it's not even a budget conversation, which shocks me. Uh, and the other thing is uh, we threw in some rolls of tape and so when I opened that container and had that box and I opened it up, I said, what the hell is this? And I learned that, oh, it's dry acrylate aircraft adhesive with 60 year lifespan, non embrittling full flexibility with a, like a negative 30. I was like, what? And it's also vapor permeable. I was like, I was shocked at this like NASA tape. And so it also is not that expensive. So not only the install with the performance and the materials and this beautiful, beautiful air sealing stuff they can put in, like it's actually like, it's actually kind of like this gorgeous ecosystem to, to operate in now instead of like a tube of caulk from Home Depot. But so I just wanted to throw out that that's, that's why I became a nerd. I saw this stuff, it shocked me into like seeing like the other side, <laughs> like uh, looking through the fiddle. So it's been, it's been fun in that sense. So. Oh, that's that's awesome. Um, well, thank you, Sam, for your for your leadership, and thank you, Zola Windows, for your leadership. Um, and I, I also want to um, express my gratitude towards Zola for being the first founding sponsor of Pass Pass Accelerator and helping us um, become who we are today. Uh, and I just um, I'm so excited to see uh, the work that the company is doing, and and uh, and really appreciate that you were here today sam and thank you everyone for attending and for all of your great questions